game from this match of the 1990 between Kasparov and Karpov. We're going to look at Anatoly's first win in the match. This must have given you a great deal of satisfaction uh, after being down one game for several games, and then in game seven you struck back with the white pieces. Uh, yes, I, I could show interesting, uh, interesting play and a uh, very nice position of plan, exchanging uh, kingside knights, after which uh, I got, I got uh, positional advantage for the whole game. So we'll take a look. This, Gary uh, resorted to his king's Indian defense, something that he adopted uh, frequently in the match. Yeah, knight c3. c3. Bishop g7. e4. d6. Knight f3. Castle. Bishop e2. e5. e5. Okay, then. Okay, so we'll, we'll start from this position after bishop e3. And now here he played knight a6. Then castle. Knight castled. Yes. Knight to g4. Knight g4. Bishop g5. This is clear. F6. Bishop goes back to c1. And so the case is that now knight on g4 is not feeling so well. I think previously played was knight to h6 in many games, and now he played king h8. Yes, so he, want, he wants to, to bring king from uh, dangerous diagonal a2, g8. He wants to get off this diagonal to yes. avoid any tricks later. Yes. So now you went ahead and kicked the knight, and then when he went back, now you played a new idea here. You played d takes e5. The other plan would be to keep this Tension bishop in the center, yes, this with was bishop possible. e3, or even to play d5 and try to expand on the queen side. But if you do that, he's set up to play f5 and get some counterattack on the king side. Yes, I, I just wanted to play against a bad knight on h6. Mm -hmm. And so I, I wanted to, so to by take... playing d takes e5. Yes. Okay, he has a choice here of recaptures. The normal positional method would be to play d takes e5, but then... You might play bishop e3, c5, and start to expand on the queen side. Which, and, which he didn't... And as you said, the knight so in this case is not so uh, participating in the action. And that's right. So in the game... He, he took, uh, he recaptured with another pawn, and he was uh, strongly criticized, but uh, I don't think he should be so much criticized for this. Mm -hmm. So you, you're saying that he was criticized a little unjustly for, for taking with the f-pawn? Yes. Bishop e3, this is. And then knight f7, and now queen d2. Queen d2. Now, of course, he, he, he might be contemplating bishop h6 to try and exchange off your good bishop. Yes, so. But of course, you never give him such a moment. <laughs> After me. And now he played knight c5. And then? And now, yeah, I mean, I've played the king's Indian for many games with white, and... You know, here I would think maybe to play b4, but then the knight comes back to e6, and I would try to expand on the queen side. But here you played uh, a plan that just made it look so simple. You played knight to g5 to exchange off this knight. Why would you exchange this knight? Like I didn't like that he could bring his knight to e6, and then he would have many possibilities just to play knight to f4, and try to open a uh, black, uh, black bishop. Or he, he, he would stop my play with uh, knight g5. And actually, I don't need this knight anymore. Uh, I must open my white color bishop. Mm -hmm. So in the game, after knight to g5, he exchanged knights. And then he offered to exchange bishops with bishop f6. But that wasn't really part of the plan for you. No, you don't really want to exchange course. these bishops. <laughs> So you simply retreated, and now he goes knight to e6 anyway. And here is your idea of bishop g4 that you're able to get this bishop in the game. Yes, I want to exchange white color bishops. For knight f4, you're free to exchange bishops. Yes, and then I have, I have clear positional advantage and because you, you my always... bishop is much better than a black bishop. So in the game, he played h5, figuring that if he's going to let you exchange this bishop, He'd rather you exchange the bishop for this knight than for his bishop. Yes. Now here we have a game where he has the two bishops, but this bishop is kind of boxed in, 
and by his pawns, and this bishop is kind of boxed in by your pawns. So, <laughs> so in this case, the two bishops aren't really a big, big advantage. Yes, you're right. So after you captured and captured, you went ahead and played knight to d5. Yes, he played bishop to h4. Of now, course, he of cannot course, allow bishop g5. Also, if he exchanges, you take with the c pawn probably, and then you have pressure on the c file. Yes. So in the game, he played bishop h4. As you point out, if he goes bishop back, then bishop g5, and you're, you're crawling all over his position. Mm -hmm. So in the game, he played bishop here. Also, it seems to me that Gary plays moves like this sometimes to try and provoke you into <laughs> advancing <laughs> into so that he can yes. get some sacrificial yes. attack against your king. Into some weaknesses, yes. But of course, you've played him uh, a number of games now, so you, you would never so this is be not tempted trick, by such trick, fate. Yes. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So now you simply played rook at a to c1, and, and you, you assess that white has a slight, slight positional advantage at this point. More space, better minor pieces. I just want to bring my knight to d3 and try to open, uh, to open uh, queen side with c4, c5. Okay. So after king h7, now rook to c3. The idea here is you're going to bring the other rook, and then you have some flexibility about which way to go with your rooks. Uh, I don't know. I just wanted to play to play solid this game, and so I, I played the rook c3. But uh, maybe maybe I should start already with b3 because later on I came back with this rook. Mm -hmm. So he played rook f7, and now you did in fact play b3. This just kind of strengthens your c4 pawn. He played c6 to kick your knight away, and now the knight went back to to b4. And here he played rook to d7. Maybe he's worried that you will... Yeah, I had this in mind, but then I, dis I discovered that uh, I cannot uh, organize uh, uh, decisive pressure over pawn on d6. That's why there is no sense to double uh, rook and so, queen. So now you simply retreated. Are you allowed to change your, your mind like this in a world championship match? So this is a difficult moment, of course, when you have to, when you have to, change, uh, to change your plan. Mm. But it's better at the right moment to, mm. to make such moves than, mm -hmm. than discover this when you have to. But actually, Gary, Gary, this happened later in the match in Lyon, where you put a piece on one square and then you changed your mind a few moves later and went back. And Gary said this actually shows very strong character because most players especially, you know, in front of a big audience, they'd be afraid to admit that, oh, I made a mistake, or I didn't do the right thing right, or I wasn't sure, and to actually make a move and then come back. So then you have to, uh, <laughs> how to say it, you have to consider reality. Yes. So he played bishop back to f6, and now here you played f4, and you give this an exclamation point. I guess the idea here is that so, so many pieces of blacks are away from the king side, now, by playing f4, you open up some chances for this rook. No, white color bishop is bad, uh, and so I just want to, uh, I just want to make pressure over d6 pawn, and then trying to open the king side because h5 is uh, a little weakness. A little weakness, mm -hmm. and so I have uh, clear initiative with uh, double rook, rook f3, rook f1. I have many plans here. So here in the game, he played e takes f5. The major alternative was d5 which, after a series of exchanges, it would open up for your rooks. His rook is still in the corner. Yes. So in the game, after e takes f4, you take with the bishop, and we can see the pressure mounting. So Gary decides to escape with his queen and plays queen a5. I guess he's hoping now to bring his rook over. Yes, but then, then there but, is a typical... But now there's a typical motif with the queens being vis-a-vis -vis each other. Right? <laughs> And so you play knight to here. At knight d5, yes. And this, uh, this is a discover attack. And how did Gary look when you played this move? Uh, I remember he, he played queen a5, and then he discovered, of course, queen knight d5, which is not so difficult. And then uh, he, was, uh, he was expecting this move with a big fear. And then when I played, maybe it was even easier for him that I played. Mm -hmm. It's uh, much more difficult to expect a strong move than to get it. Uh -huh. So what better way to study chess than to sit back, relax, and watch, listen, and learn how the masters think? Discover the thought processes and competitive spirit 
of a world champion as Anatoly Karpov guides you through his best games and his selected games of Bobby Fischer. Walter Brown shows you how he won the US Championship six times and teaches you how to play the Sicilian. Three-time US Champion Lev Albert helps you to understand the Banco Gambit. E5, he uh, has a choice here, either Queen to D8 to just uh, play passively and retreat, or Queen C5 check. So of, of, course, course, of course, Queen D8 he couldn't play because Knight takes F6, and then Bishop takes, bishop takes, takes Pawn, and King is absolutely open. Mm -hmm. So not only do you win one pawn, but his king is absolutely naked. Yes, yes, and so, so you so, cannot do this. So, so queen c5 is the uh, only move. So queen c5 check to your king. Now in the game, this is a critical moment. You actually played king h1 in the game. But then with the benefit of analysis after the game, uh, it was discovered that bishop e3 actually was even stronger. Yes, I was thinking here, for quite a long time, and uh, so I couldn't I couldn't find the, the the right continuation. I I saw that Bishop E3 would be correct, but uh, but then uh, then I couldn't find the right moment, and the Bishop G5 is clear move. After Bishop G5, Knight F6 check. What I could not uh, discover that of course King G7 is not so good, uh, but uh, King G7 would lose quickly. But king h6 is the main King h6, uh, and so I I didn't find just a very strong move, because rook c to e1. This simply protects the bishop, rather, yeah. rather than get confused with all the complications of taking and taking and taking and taking. Just a simple quiet move. Yes. Simply protecting the bishop. If he exchanges after simply rook takes, his king is on the dark square, rook, uh, rook is, his rook uh, is under attack. You just simply sidestep, and then his king is in terrible exposed position. Yes. So here, rook f7, and then very, very strong and very important move. E5. E5. And uh, so this move would, uh, would solve all the problems. Uh, the point being that if he takes with a pawn, then when you take his queen... No, no. No? No, if, if he takes here, then I play... Before on up, and then uh, then he has to exchange bishops. Then I take with the rook, and so when he plays queen d4, just keeping pin, I just take with the queen, and rook takes bishop. And if he doesn't keep the pin, then you have just a free discover check. Yes, creation would virtually win a piece. Yes. So in the game, after queen c5 check, instead of bishop e3, you played king h1. Only move bishop takes bishop takes uh, d5. And now, of course, you take with the pawn yes. on the c-file. This attacks his queen and attacks here. Yes, and so he can play now queen b6, because then bishop e3. You expose on this one. Yes, and after queen d8, d takes c6, and rook takes d6. Not only do you win a pawn, but his king is still very yes, exposed. Yes, you're just hopeless. So in the game, he decided that if he's going to lose a pawn, he would rather go ahead and try to exchange queens and uh, maybe make a draw in the end game. Yes, but so it played, didn't happen. <laughs> late queen takes d4. Then I took on c6. Then he took on c6. And now you went ahead and snatched the, the pawn. Yes, then he played rook 8. If he takes here, you just simply take the pawn on d6. Yes, of course. And then he is very exposed. Oh, so rook e8, and then you, I played... Now you played rook c4, just rook protecting. Rook c4, yes. And this encouraged him to exchange queens. And then he played bishop. Yeah, two. bishop is under attack. 2e5. So now you, you basically now you have an endgame with one solid extra pawn. This should be enough to win, but... But still, it's not so easy. It's not so easy because now I would prefer my pawns to be uh, h2 and g3 instead of g2 and h3. Uh, because now some moment the uh, back rank might be a little... Yes, a little it's not weak. so easy to, to secure your king in such position. So in the game, after bishop e5, you continued bishop e3. This keeps an eye on the pawn down there. Now he went bishop e3. Bishop g3 and then rook f3. 
And now this is interesting is that Gary is never one to just sit back and passively defend. And here, in order to play and try to have some chance for a checkmate later, he advances, which during the heat of battle seems like a good idea. But later, it appears that this advance led to another advance, which led to more weaknesses in the endgame. Yes, but after h4, there is, uh, there is bishop exchange. Mm -hmm. Maybe he decided that in uh, uh, four rooks ending, he, he could have more chances than with bishops. So after here, he's forced to exchange. Now you take with the rook. Here he went rook at d to e7. And now you attack and defend. You defend your pawn on e4, and you attack his pawn on h4. This encourages him to make one more advance with g5. And now you proceed up the board. Rook f6, and now king, king is... Uh, his king is cut off. Uh, cut off, yes. From the defense. So now he goes ahead and exchanges, but this also trades a pair of rooks and uh, reduces rook. down to just a single rook ending. He regains his pawn for the moment, but not only do you regain it, you threaten to check and take a second pawn. Yes. So here he's forced to go back. Yes, because he couldn't play a5, rook d5. If, uh, if, if, if he, he plays uh, f5, a5, then yeah. rook d5, then for instance a4, then I take pawn on g5, and after a, b, a, b3, a, b3, rook b4, I have move rook g4, mm -hmm. and I'm winning. You win a second pawn. Yes. So actually, this is an important moment. So once he has to go rook back, then, then you play rook a6. Rook a6. Now he's completely passive. Yes. His king is cut on the sixth rank, so it can't advance. His rook is tied down to the weakness. So this is hopeless. And he made some, some more moves, but... He played king g7, and you played king g1. And at this moment, the game was actually uh, adjourned, because in those days, we still had adjournments. <laughs> yes, yes. And uh, he, his team actually resigned after, after a few hours. They called us and they said that he resigns. Yes, because the plan is very easy. First I just move b4, b5, then a4, and then I just come with the king. And the king comes to here, and then it's a question of what he lets go. Yes, yes. Thank you, Gambit. So, uh